everyone. Now we are going to the last session of the 2D Free Blockchain Bootcamp for Women organized by KB. To conclude the event, we have with us an eminent person of hyperledger blockchain, a futurist technology transformation leader, none other than Marta Piazka. She's a director of ecosystem at Hyperledger. As her role at Hyperledger, Marta has evangelized the technology and open source at the conferences around the world helping enterprises in applying the technology or the permission blockchains in their different use cases. She has early served as a head of the enterprise collaboration at the Cambridge Blockchain Society, also the member of the Technical Governing Body, Board of Trustees at Sovereign Foundation. It's a great honor to have Marta on the two-day international blockchain bootcamp for women organized by KB. On behalf of KB and KB Women Connect, I extend my warm greeting to you on this day, Matt. Thank you uh, for having me. Thank you for uh, this honor. I wish I could be with you in India right now, although, as you can see, there is sun outside, at least a bit um, for me. Um, I will share my screen and uh, show you a couple of slides. I would like like to make this session as interactive as possible. I have no ambition of going through all of my slides. So uh, if you'd like to interrupt me and ask questions, uh, you are able to raise your hand, as I uh, I believe, and you can type in your questions in the Q&A. So um, if it's possible to um, get people that will want to ask questions to um, you know, enable them to speak so that we can have some kind of a more human interaction than just reading questions. That would be amazing. Um, but with having said that, let me just start with, uh, with my slides. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see your slide. Go ahead now. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, I was asked to talk to you a bit about Hyperledger and how to get involved with Hyperledger. Um, and my main mission here today is to have you walk away with understanding that everybody's welcome in Hyperledger. And this is a very inclusive community. And speaking of, you know, International Women's Day and empowerment and all that, I think that I am proud to be part of this community because it's such an such a focused on exactly those values, exactly on, on that. As a matter of fact, we have far more female employees on Hyperledger staff than we have male. Uh, so Brian Bellender, our executive director, definitely puts his actions where his words are and uh, really tries to, to embrace the uh, empowerment and uh, equality and uh, all those virtues. So uh, we have the... Um, the, the 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 statement or or the motto that or are, are welcome in hyperledger and we try to not only say it but also make it happen uh and that means that we want you and if there is a tiny itch of you wanting to get involved understand how to be part of hyperledger and i'm guessing that's uh one of the reasons why I, why you're listening to this presentation um that is a good itch and you should be making it less scr or scratch it and and get engaged and uh, see that there is a space for you no matter what you're doing uh no matter what's your background your knowledge uh feel confident that your help is needed and uh, your um contributions will be welcome what does it mean actually to be inclusive uh, if you look at the dictionary, uh, inclusive means including everyone. What does it mean to include? It means to take or in or comprise as a part of a whole, um, whole or whole or group, right? Uh, it means that every single individual becomes a part of a bigger group, a bigger structure. And we do think of everybody that's participating in Hyperledger as those individuals and as people that um, have their unique experiences. Um, but the truth is that people do not stay in the community unless they feel empowered, engaged, and included. Uh, and that is a big challenge of building open source communities. How do you make sure that participants or, you know, passers-by that just want to wander in and see what 
a, a thing a project is about in our case what hyperledger is about how do they actually stay involved and feel that uh, they are a part of this community in hyperledger are we we have very strong principles uh First and foremost, we are 100% open source. Uh, this means that our community uh, is not pay to play. You can contribute, you can participate, you can join any of the special interest groups or working groups uh, without uh, paying anything, without being an official member. As a matter of fact, we didn't even build an individual membership status in Hyperledger because we believe that anybody that just brushes against Hyperledger comes to a single event should consider themselves a member of Hyperledger community. Uh, Hyperledger is also led by technical contributors. So while we have a lot of opportunities to get engaged and learn how to further contribute on the technical level for non-technical people, uh, the final part, the, the way to become a leader in this community is to contribute in technical ways. That doesn't necessarily mean, mean building code. Uh, quite often it is just writing out specifications or helping with documentation, but there has to be some kind of technology aspect to your work. Um, a great example here is uh, Bobby Muscara, who is uh, on our technical steering committee uh, and I don't think Bobby ever written a single line of code in her life. She runs a training company uh, but she's been very actively helping create um, uh, training material and uh, leading the learning materials working group uh, to the point where we recognize or the community recognized that uh, she would be a very valuable addition, a human addition to the technical steering committee. Um, but it's only those who do are the ones who get a leadership position in Hyperledger. Uh, there is no way of buying yourself a spot on the technical steering committee. There is no way that you can just come in and uh, throw money at uh, developers and say, now from now on, you'll be making working on these or that feature. Um, it's all about who you are, what's your merit, and uh, how this community recognizes you as an individual. So I get involved. Well, what would be the reason why any one of you here would want to be involved? First, you can shape the direction of a project to fit your needs and use cases. Very often uh, I talk to people and I hear, oh gosh, you know, I wish Hyperledger sort of supported something, um, PBFT. And all I can say, well, if you don't work on that support, why would you expect other people to? Um, you have the power to shape the direction of the project, but it's also your responsibility to come up with features and to come up with direction if you want to uh, shape the project. Uh, you also, from a company perspective, decrease time to market and accelerate the work of the project and what you want sooner uh, because there are so many people working on the same thing together and you get a beautiful collaboration of companies that might even be, be competitive uh, in outside world uh, they all work together to support the development of the code base that then becomes uh, the the base of their their products uh, and that's a very important part of open source it's the concept of um, increased return of it on investment because there is always a certain level of uh, initial work that has to be done um, for every company now if we work together everyone can work on a slightly different piece of that puzzle and together create the final solution if we work separately you know, maybe there is a bit of competitiveness, so we put more pressure on each other. But at the end of the day, it's very wasteful, very resource consuming and just pointless. Why would I work on the same thing as a colleague of mine as you do if we can work together and just together come up with a better solution? Um, there is this very nice saying that with enough eyes, all bags are, are shallow, uh, meaning that 
the more people look at the code, the more people actually try to um, to t pressure test it, the easier it gets to build a code that is actually flawless or close to as close to flawless as possible. And I must say we see that every day with um, our bug bounty program. We have a very uh, liberal, very um, 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 rich bug bounty program where you can actually find bugs in your code, in uh, Hyperledger code bases and get paid for it. So if you really want to have a fun side hassle, you can just analyze the code and get paid for bugs you find. But as it turns out, there are not many bugs that people find because there are so many people who test the code that work on it together, that do all of the um, uh, audits and so on before it sees the daylight, uh, that there are not many bugs to be found. And if they, there are bugs that people find, they are usually quite minor thankfully. And, you know, it can change. Maybe it's not enough people or not enough incentive for people to, to pressure test the code, but for now it's, it seems to be working. Also, you get to learn a lot. Um, it is very different when you work alone on a code, and I'm sure that um, having studied uh, or be, having been students, you know that very well, that it's different to sit there on your own and try to solve a problem, uh, even with the best workbook. Uh, and it's different to have a study circle and to work together on the project and uh, learn from each other and um, get support from others that might have a slightly different background. Uh, and that's the best way to learn, especially when it comes to technology. You can also gain experience that will look great on your resume. And that's more maybe for people who are slightly earlier in their career, but, you know, getting a, a job at a big open source project is usually quite hard. I mean, you know, it's there are only as many jobs out there and usually they have various requirements and um, nobody will hire you as a freshman uh, if you have never worked on a code. But when you have big open source projects, nobody's asking for your resume. They're asking you to start working on the code and start helping. And the more you help, the more you learn, the more the bigger portfolio you build. And especially today, you know, it's it's been a very interesting journey for me because um, I'm 33, almost 33 years old. Uh, so even for me, when I was studying, it was very clear that I have to get my master's degree, get my PhD if I ever want to get a good job. But by the time I was already finishing my PhD, uh, the feeling and the kind of um, appreciation for uh, experience over um, uh, over uh, just, you know, good grades in school uh, has changed dramatically. So, you know, I, I have a PhD and nobody really ever asks me about it other than maybe, um, you know, as I can tell an anecdote, one of the, how once I, I was a PhD student and how I hated it. Um, but, but when I talk to people when I had all of my job interviews, nobody really cared. Uh, it, they cared much more about the projects that I worked on and the volunteer work that I've done, um, both in technology and outside of technology. So uh, yeah, open source is a great way to do this. And you get a group of people that are interested in the things that you are, which is also great because especially, you know, when you are a minority of sorts, or uh, you don't have people around you that are passionate about the same things, building that community or getting into that community of uh, people that are already passionate and, you know, internet is helping us tremendously with, with connecting with others, right? Uh, so you really get to, to get involved and meet friends that you normally never meet. I mean, you know, I was one of um, two women studying uh, computer science in Poland uh, in my year. We had 120 men and, and two women. Um, 
And it was only when I started looking outside of my year, when I started participating in various activities, and then especially that I was fascinated by security, which wasn't a very popular or, uh, domain. I would say most of my friends wanted to go into networking and, uh, and, and administration and things like that. So it was only when I started looking around and participating in open source projects and focused on security, being part of the uh, free open source um, software foundation that's when I found people that are as passionate as I am about the same things and uh, we were able to start things like uh social hacks or random hacks of kindness um which is a very cool initiative if you haven't heard about them i highly recommend it. it's it's a very nice way of bringing the technology and social impact together um but all of that came through me being involved with projects that didn't pay anything uh i just wanted to learn something and to find friends and yes it's said to say that i needed to find friends but i guess you know it's hard <laughs> sometimes um, so how do you participate in the open source community? I think that the, the three things that are very good to start with, or the principles that you should take with you is first, feel free to lurk. Uh, there is no good or bad, right or wrong when it comes to interacting with an open source community. Um, we all have appreciation for being different and having different backgrounds, different cultures, different languages. So nobody will judge you for asking questions. Um, if you ask questions and then don't really read the material that you've been pointed at, then probably they will start judging you, but for being lazy, not for not knowing things. Um, um, but every newcomer is always welcome and uh, if anything we the more you know um, experienced open sourcers uh, we will feel bad that your question has been left unattended for too long but don't feel discouraged either because we are all humans and we all get very very busy so if you're not getting an answer maybe it's worth prodding again or maybe it's worth reformulating your question a bit uh, to see if you get an answer then and most importantly don't wait for an invitation um, the open source community is as i said a duocracy the only those who do get a voice in the room and so this is your invitation. Here you go. I personally invite each and every one of you to participate in an open source project. And you can ask me for an email if you want, and I can email you an invitation if that makes you feel more comfortable. But honestly, just show up and it'll be fun. It'll be good. Um, it is worth reading the code of conduct, and I think that every healthy open source community should have a code of conduct, because while we are all nice to each other and should be nice, it's always good to have some kind of a rule book or a guidance on how to behave, especially in a situation where we don't, often don't see each other, can't read each other's emotions. And that's where a lot of the challenges of open source community um, happen or come from is, is that lack of face-to-face -face communication when which I mean after a year of sitting in the same room and looking out the same window I can tell you I'm missing human connections and I'm sure all of you do as well and everyone has a different story it's it's worth remembering that no two open source journeys are the same and no two open source contributors are the same you will have people who want to just fix bugs you know they are coders they want to come in and improve the code there are people that want to just use the project and that's also fine you do contribute by using you just contribute by using and promoting what you the, the code by helping it become the most prevailing or the most popular code out there uh, that is as well very important so don't disqualify or don't underestimate the contributions that you're making to the uh, community if you're not coding. Um, and I do want to make sure that you remember this because not all of us are coders. Not all of us knows uh, can help with fixing or building new features. 
but there is a tremendous amount of work that has to be done that in some cases sometimes is even more important because you know we can always hire developers or developers can be hired to fix the code it's much harder to find people who will have the time to test to work to to write the documentation to translate things all of this fairly um minor in some ways but very hard and much less rewarding tasks i would even say then there are just people who are at the beginning of their journey and they want to uh, understand what the projects do and how to use them um and finally there are people who want to contribute new features so they are not interested in fixing what's not working they want to build new code and for those of you who want to build new things, I would uh, suggest that um, you first engage in, um, uh, in, in the community and sh show up and help fixing a couple of bugs or at least participate in the mailing list or discussion forums before you propose new features. It's just like, you know, imagine that you're building your own thing or I, I, I cook a lot. So I like to make a lot of com comparisons to cooking. So you're making your own cake and, you know, you're working on it. You came up with the recipe, you bought the ingredients. And then somebody comes into through the do kitchen door and says, oh, no, you know, I would do it completely different. Like try adding five eggs in instead of six. I, if I don't know that person, if I don't have a certain trust in their abilities, I just feel like they are an intruder. And it's not, it's just a natural human reaction. It has nothing to do with that person or with me. It's just the way that things goes. So things go. So try first engaging with a community and showing your interest and interest in learning from others before you start pushing for new features. Um, before I dive into certain elements of, of Hyperledger and designing for inclusivity, I see that there is a question here. Um, I have heard about uh, Bath blockchain automation framework, which automates the Hyperledger fabric setup and gives much more scalability. Does Hyperledger plan on such kinds of automation frameworks for the easy deployment of Hyperledger fabric? Um, I'm not sure if I understand uh, the um, the question a uh, hundred uh, hundred percent, but in general, there is a lot of push from the community to automate um, a lot of the um, a, a lot of the work or, or deployments. So I, I would imagine so. Um, there is. It's a hard question when you ask, does Hyperledger plan to do something? Uh, because it's literally a collection of people who don't even know each other and they know each other's nicknames or on chat or mailing list. So they sit and they plan for things and then someone else comes and proposes a completely different project. And that project may be complementary to Hyperledger Fabric in that case but it is not driven by the same group of people. So Hyperledger Fabric is being cu currently contributed, um, uh, uh, being developed by over, I think five or 600 developers around the world that contribute on a daily basis. Um, these people work for various companies and sometimes uh, just are passionate and, and volunteer. Um, and because Hyperledger Fabric is so widely used, quite often people come in and uh, say, well, we would like to do this or that. And so in this case, uh, the blockchain automation framework was a project that uh, developers in Accenture were building and they just uh, suggested that uh, they would like to build it out as a Hyperledger lab. Um, labs being like an R&D space for Hyperledger where you can just come in with your idea and host a project and it's not an official Hyperledger Hyperledger project as such, but it, we help with building the community and um, give you the GitHub repository and mailing list and things like that. So Bath had nothing to do with core fi Hyperledger Fabric. It was just um, a side project of someone, so similarly to the uh, BIF blockchain integration framework, which is now Hyperledger Cactus. Um, and as BIF shows, you know, this kind of project that is um, just as you know, uh, someone's R and D little uh, experiment can then turn into full-fetched uh, part of the greenhouse, but it doesn't have to. 
Uh, so uh, I don't know if there is much planning around it. I don't think that it's on the roadmap of uh, Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, there might be some work being done by uh, other Hyperledger Fabric users. Uh, so I would take a look at uh, Hyperledger Labs and see if there is something in there that you're looking for. Or simply just join the mailing list of uh, Bath and uh, ask there if that's something they are planning. Um, is there any scope of integrating IoT with existing projects in Hyperledger? Um, would you be able to expand a bit more on that? Um, because m maybe that's that's something that um, be, as as you're as I'm waiting for the um, ex wider explanation, uh, I'll clarify this. Um, Hyperledger code bases are going back to my culinary comparisons are like a pre-made uh, puff pastry or sponge that you buy in a shop and then you put a layer of the cream and jam and whatever and make a cake out of it that you can you know, serve to your guests. Nobody really will eat the pure sponge. They want the additional things on it. But baking the sponge is what takes the most time and more effort. And what we do in Hyperledger is we provide that sponge. Now, you can use that sponge to make it into a Victoria sponge or a red velvet or a brownie or whatever else, right? Or a chocolate cake. Um, and so integrating IoT with existing Hyperledger projects, there are a lot of solutions out there that are using Hyperledger code bases um, to um, uh, Hyperledger code bases to build IoT solutions. So, for instance, um, they use the blockchain, say uh, Hyperledger Besu, uh, as a layer for IoT devices to upload their um, measure uh, measurements from the sensors uh, and to use the blockchain as a source of provenance or a proof of provenance. Uh, there are projects around supply chain and tracking where the blockchain is used for tracking and IoT devices are using used uh, in uh, containers to measure the um, like the, the conditions in which food is being transported and that's also uploaded to the blockchain. So we don't really build industry specific blockchains because we think of blockchain as a, or distributed ledger as a technology that is an enabler for virtually anything um so in in some ways you know uh, hyperledger indie is very much focused on identity but it's doesn't matter if it's an identity system for animals for things like an IoT identity system or for humans or for COVID credentials, it can be anything. Hyperledger fabric is being used, you know, in the fashion industry, in supply chain, in uh, food, in uh, even uh, actually there is a project that um, uh, allows you to uh, d d find or, or yeah, uh, find uh, fraudulent uh, whiskies, uh, where you can uh, analyze the um, visual or yeah, v visual aspects of a liquid that is uh, supposed to be a say ten-year-old Japanese whiskey, um, and use the blockchain to verify if that kind of liquid could be a ten-year-old Japanese whiskey or it's something else. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Uh, if, if not, then feel free to uh, pop into the chat, uh, or if we can un unmute you, then that would be great. Um, does Hyperledger Fabric support uh, archival of uh, data in its upcoming releases? Do you mean uh, like revocation, or do you mean like offloading information from blockchain to to an off-chain storage uh, in in general once something is on a blockchain it stays there forever um, so there is no plan in introducing deletion or anything like that um, there are some efforts towards sharding and kind of batching things so that um, you can kind of never get rid of the data but uh, keep the metadata rather than just uh, every single detail 
um, on the blockchain, meaning that it reduces the size. It's, uh, size. it's similar to what uh, public blockchains are doing. Um, the The real issue is that with permission blockchains, the the idea is that there won't be ever as much data as on a public blockchain. So it should it should have that sorry that big of an impact on um, uh, on it. Okay, any more questions for now? Okay, I'll, I'll... have uh, answered the questions. Please go ahead, they may pop in between. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what do we do in Hyperledger to support this inclusiv inclusivity? Uh, first of all, we work on documentation. We make sure that it's up to date. We prioritize documentation tasks and update the uh, update it based on uh, FAQs. So, if you have questions, one of the reasons why it's important for you to ask questions is that it means that there wasn't an answer in the documentation, or there is, and we'll then point you at uh, reading the documentation. But it's a very good feedback loop on how good our onboarding process is. Uh, we have. Uh, introductory tutorials uh, to help you learn more uh, and uh, making sure that basically everything works together. Um, we have a, we try to have a good contribution uh, process or well documented the, the contribution process uh, with guides and uh, understanding that there are many ways of contributing. What I I discussed earlier. And uh, we are actually about to release uh, another kind of guide on contribution pathways and ways for everyone to contribute, no matter if you're a coder or not. Um, we also um, try to be as transparent and uh, open as possible. Almost all of our conversations, well, no, all of our conversations are held online. We use wiki and mailing to do this and all the decisions are made publicly. So if you don't know where to find uh, those, this information of you know, why a certain decision was made or how do you get into a meeting, um, then I suggest going to wiki.hyperledger.org where all of it is described. And all of the meetings, like even if it's something is called a maintainer meeting, you're more than welcome to join and speak up. It's not even a webinar style, it's a regular call. So you can just unmute yourself and speak. Um, and we do try and encourage projects, although it varies from project to project, to um, label uh, good first issues or good first bugs, uh, where if you go into GitHub or Jira, uh, you will find that a certain bug is uh, was tagged as a good first bug, so one that you can, might want to take up if uh, you, you're new to the community and you want to do like a minor easy fix to get to ease yourself into it. As I mentioned, this is your invitation and I will hammer it uh, into you. Please get involved. Um, there are certain guides, uh, guidelines and guides for getting started. Um, I encourage you to read those four um, very good resources. We have how to contribute to open source, uh, we have uh, getting involved in open source projects, 10 entry points to tech for girls, women, and everyone, and a beginner's guide to contributing uh, to open source. Uh, these are very, very good open source uh, resources. I'm happy to share my slides or the links uh, with you afterwards, uh, or you can just Google for the titles and you'll find it. It's all publicly available. Uh, there is a very good um, website called opensource.guide. Uh, that also will give you a lot of hints on, on how to work with open source projects. Oh, and now we get into, sorry. Uh, uh, always happens, doesn't it? There we go. Um, so if you haven't, Please do take a look at our meetups. Uh, currently, you know, in the COVID world, they all happen online. So you actually don't have to participate only in your local meetup. You could participate in one that is happening in anywhere in the world, as long as you 
are okay with the time uh, slot it's happening in. Um, and we have a massive, massive community. Meetups are a great, great way to start interacting and collaborating with community members because by default, people that show up for meetups are those who are as interested in uh, participating as you are. Uh, and we have over 70,000 meetup organizer, uh, meetup members, uh, over 170 groups in 80 countries. As a matter of fact, in India, we have an amazing India chapter. So not only do we have local, um, uh, local meetups uh, in um, major cities in India, we also have just a chapter that is uh, collecting all of the meetup groups from various cities into one. Um, it's incredible, incredible work. And I know that um, Sangits and uh, other universities in India have been doing a wonderful job at uh, facilitating it and bringing everyone together and encouraging more uh, collaboration. So thank you for that. There are many ways in which you could participate in a meetup. You could attend one, of course. Uh, you could speak at one uh, at a meetup. And I know that all the meetups are always looking for new speakers. So uh, it's a great way for an opportunity to introduce yourself and uh, make it so that you're, um, yeah, just get to know the community better and show what you're doing. Um, you can also uh, support a meetup either by providing space and food. That's when we are allowed to meet in person again. Um, or by uh, helping with organ our organization uh, of a meetup in your area. Uh, if you have any questions or would want to get involved, you can always email us. And David Boswell, my colleague, is a very, very experienced community builder. And we'll definitely be happy to get you involved with meetups. There are some basic tools that uh, every Hyperledger project uses. Uh, first, you should set up yourself an account on a Linux, founda uh, Linux Foundation uh, account. It's free of charge. It's very simple, uh, but it will and it will allow you to um, just get access to all of the collaboration tools and um, kind of be identified across various Linux Foundation projects. And one thing that may be I should mention here is that while well, you know I'm representing Hyperledger and that's my favorite project, Linux Foundation has over uh, 80 different projects uh, in every major industry. There is one on energy, one on AI, one of uh, edge computing, one of uh, cloud native computing, uh, uh, networking, automotive, drone, uh, media, film, basically anything. And so if you are interested, and participating in an open source community, but blockchain isn't necessarily your thing, I promise you that there is something that you will find interesting. And what I'm talking here about is not specific to Hyperledger so much as to the Linux Foundation and how we work. So do feel free to Google for or search for Linux Foundation project and see if there is something that you'd find interesting and exciting. If you want to join the discussion, we have a chat. Uh, the chat uh, is um, uh, kind of a, a, a way for us to communicate in a more real time uh, manner. Uh, we also have a mailing list, uh, which allows you to ask questions and communicate with other participants. Um, it's uh, not as, um, let's say, as real time, uh, but it will give you answer or will get you answers and will probably uh, be a very good way, especially when you have more complicated issues or questions. Uh, GitHub is where we store our code. Uh, we have a bug reporting system and every project has that uh, described. And then we have Wiki where we keep the kind of living, uh, it's like a living book where you are constantly, constantly update information about all the projects, all the working groups, special interest groups, and uh, so on. Mm. So you can contribute code uh, to our existing projects by getting a copy of the repository, finding an issue to work on, making the changes, creating a pull request, then expect comments. And please don't feel offended if there are comments. It only means that people care. And that's great. And then you will have to address those comments before your pull can be requests can be merged. 
Um, you can also start a new Hyperledger lab. I mentioned that, uh, which is a way if like you have a project and I know that there is a hackathon that is happening right now. So if you are working on a hackathon um, or a hackathon project right now and uh, afterwards feel like actually you'd want to continue working on it and you'd like to build a community around it, um, then proposing a new Hyperledger lab is a very good idea. And it's a very simple process that is described on our GitHub. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Um, we are aiming to work on uh, bringing Hyperledger to many more languages. Uh, this work has started with uh, translating Hyperledger fabric documentation into several languages, or, mm, including Portuguese, Japanese, Malayam, uh, Spanish, French, and Russian. And currently we have even more uh, work and more contributions happening. So even more languages to come, including Italian. Uh, we will hope, or we, we have now managed to make hyper information about Hyperledger Fabric available to more than 1 billion people who speak those languages, which I'm very proud of. And it's been an amazing work and again, Thank you guys uh, from Kerala to, for helping out with this because uh, it wouldn't have happened uh, if it wasn't for you. Uh, if you'd like to uh, translate to a language of your choice, there is a contribution contributing documentation guide um, which uh, will help you with this. Finally, if you'd like to join something that's slightly less technical, we have special interest group and working groups. Special interest groups are spec sector specific, so they focus on a special industry and how does distributed ledger technology help in that specific industry, being healthcare, social impact, supply chain, trade finance, climate action. We actually, I don't have a slide here, but we just launched media and entertainment special interest group uh, as well. So that might be something that is interesting to you. Um, and then on the other side, we have community working groups, which are focused on uh, technical aspects of an industry. So, uh, so sorry, for various aspects of technology. So things like architecture working group or identity. We have a diversity, civility and inclusion working group, which I'm uh, very happy uh, to, to, to have and to support. Um, it's one that is focusing on how can we make the distributed ledger space more inclusive and diverse. Um, and then finally, once you are an experienced uh, hyperledgerian, if that's a word, you can take on some le leadership roles. As a techno uh, technical person who is contributing code, you can help set the direction and future of any of the hyperledger projects by taking a leadership position uh, and by contributing to a project over a period of time uh, with obviously high quality contributions, uh, you can become a, a maintainer. Um, and uh, that means that uh, you will not only contribute new code, but also vet other people code and decide on the direction of the project. Uh, there are very, very different um, ways to uh, that projects uh, manage their uh, maintainer uh, submissions. Uh, so if you're uh, interested in a particular project, you probably should read the guide for that particular project. Um, if you just contribute, and it doesn't have to be code, you could contribute to one of the working groups, not special interest groups, just working groups. Um, you can be part of the technical steering committee uh, voting process. So anybody who has contributed in the past year to the code the documentation or other technical artifacts uh, to the Hyperledger code bases is eligible to run and vote in the TSC election. And uh, out of everyone that is eligible, 15 people are chosen to be the TSC for the following year. All of the meetings that of TSC are open to public, so you can absolutely join the meetings and see how TSC is working. And then we are also we have all sort of other leadership roles. We always actively look for people to contribute and also lead special interest groups and working groups. Uh, and also, of course, we have the regional chapters. You can either participate in the India uh, regional chapter or if you're outside of India, we can work on establishing a regional chapter in your country. 
Um, and then finally, of course, you know, if you want to take on a leadership, thought leadership uh, role, uh, then uh, we always welcome uh, guide, uh, writing blog posts, guides, tutorials, and all sorts of other things. And uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you again for, for having me. It, it was a pleasure uh, to be able to talk to you. Martha, thank you so much. Thank you for guiding the participants to get into the hyperledger community and build themselves into a successful hyperledgerian. Okay, audience, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A. Meanwhile, I have a question before you conclude. Would you like to recommend any book or any reference tool that inspired you about your work? Um, hmm, that's a good question. So I find our courses, the free hyperledger courses, uh, very good. I think that they really help to get started and uh, learn more about blockchain in general and hyperledger. And then I can't really recommend a particular book or a resource. I would say that what I find very um, invigorating is looking at what the various special interest groups do. And although, you know, it's not part of my job description and I definitely have more than enough things to do in my life. I do try to uh, show up to at least one meeting of every SIG uh, a, a month so that I know what there is happening and I'm subscribed to all of the mailing lists, which means that I see the presentations. So each of the special interest groups has uh, usually a speaker uh, during each of the calls. So you get exposure to a ton of very interesting work and projects that people are working on. Thanks, Martha. Any more questions from the audience? Well, you're always welcome to uh, email me or e email info at hyperledger.org. Uh, my email is uh, martha at linuxfoundation.org as well. So. I'll pop that into the chat uh, for those of you who want to contact me directly. Oh, uh, how to be part of community. Oh, I would hope that I covered that with all of the information that I, uh, that I uh, provided. Um, I guess uh, you should just show up to one of the calls, uh, the special interest group calls or working group calls. It really depends on who, how do you want to get involved? Do you want to get involved on the technical level or more on the kind of business level? Um, all of the things that I talked about, so the contributing code, being part of special interest groups, working groups, being part of meetups, uh, it's all community and it's all j j just show up and, and that's it. Uh, so if you want to learn about more about Hyperledger, uh, please go to edX.org, uh, which is a platform. Um, I'll, let, I'll just go and show it to you directly. Just bear with me. So there are three courses that we offer that are free of charge. And I apologize, I should have definitely put that into the uh, my slide deck, uh, but I think that you can still see my screen. Um, so I'll show you. If you just Google edX uh, Hyperledger, you will see the courses. Uh, and it's a series of courses. Some of them are completely free. Some of them are uh, re require a little payment. You you can just don't be fooled because here you can say that it's free, but you can add this certificate, a verified certificate for two hundred dollars. That certificate is not necessary at all. It's just uh, it's not even it doesn't the course with or without certificate doesn't have a difference. Um, there's no final exam if you paid it two hundred dollars. It's just an official certificate that says that you participate and finish the course. Um, and as you can see here, the uh, syllabus is quite ex extensive. Uh, this, uh, this particular, it's Introduction to Hyperledger Business Technology. This is the most high level one. You will find uh, also a much more technical course uh, that is called Introduction to 
Hyperledger and its technologies, I think. And then there is uh, a course on uh, Hyperledger, Ursa, Aries and Indy, which is Introduction to Self-Sovereign Identity. Uh, so these all of those three courses are definitely worth uh, taking. Uh, and then, um, and then uh, once you're done with that, and you would want some more kind of official professional certification, there are there is an official Hyperledger certified developer and certified administrator um, course and exam. That one is uh, it cover, there is a charge and there is a very hard exam that you have to pass at the end, but it is a professional certification recognized around the world. So. You can um, just do that. So you can see here, we have the introduction to Hyperledger blockchain technologies, introduction to Hyperledger sovereign identity blockchain. So that's the one. Uh, and then blockchain for business uh, and developing blockchain based identity applications. So all of those.